with this in mind, I would like to uh, give the, uh, Professor Savchenko the next uh, speech, and I'll do the same translation, and then we'll have Nikola Vedis. All right, I'll try to adjust myself to Russian language, because, you know, a long time I didn't speak Russian. Well, it probably would be interesting for you, because um, I'm halfway in, in agreement with Alexander Paschal. And, and the other half, no, I'm not. <laughs> I don't agree. But first of all, I don't agree with the historical determination, with the fate predisposition. This has already been proven in modern uh, academic works by econo economists and sociologists that creative destruction could break historical determination and there's many examples for this. If you want to later, I can show you some examples. Second of all, in my book, Anti-Ukrainian, which is right over there, you can forget one, I hope that whoever would read it will buy it. It's in Ukrainian language. And I will sign it gladly. In English, you can get it on Amazon.com. And I hope that... Uh, a few months later, I'll publish it in America. So, in other words, in this book I've proven that the, uh, the, 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 the further the historical development is from modern day, meaning the less it has an impact on today's events. This is a very important is to understand. So, you should dig deeply into the history, but for example, in my opinion, it's, it's much more is based on the, on the behavior of modern people in Ukraine. And the modern history has more effect immediately after the breakup of the Soviet Union. So, I'm like a professor, so don't like it when students <laughs> but hey yeah, Le is not a student he's a dictator this guy's a dictator so I'll just quickly outline what do I think is the most the biggest problem of Ukraine it was born in Kiev Rus And I'm going way back into the history here. But this is a fundamental problem. What is the problem? That Kiev Rus took the legal and political system from the West. And I analyzed this, the system, legal system of Kiev Rus, Germany, Scandinavian nations, same thing. I, even law enforcement, identical how they punished, for what reasons, and, and our soulness, soulfulness, our religion, our spirituality, we didn't take from Rome, we didn't take from the West, we took it from Constantinople. And we combined, which is otherwise incombinable, system of values, political, legal, material, was Western, and spiritual, was Eastern. And it's not just theoretical construction. When in Ukraine, in Kiev Rus, was attacked by Mongols and Tatars, Mongol Empire, nobody from the West protected us. And Ukraine, that's how became Ukraine became in the center of Europe. It, it was amongst its own, a stranger, amongst strangers, its own. So, I think this is, in my opinion, the main fundamental problem of Ukraine. And now we go back to 1991, I'm going to miss the entire bit of history. Um, we arrived to the conclusion that this contradiction was overcome. We decided to exit the Moscow Orthodox system and enter Western civilization. 
this decision was made the uh, passive part of Ukraine no part of Ukraine passionate part of Ukraine uh, achieved that goal and Alexander Pashavir was part of it and 13 2013-2014 the finally uh, was uh, cemented during the war with Russia and I see and I also believe and I think that you won't uh, contradict me that Ukraine Ukrainians generally share Western values what are the values? What are they fundamentally? Humanity, democracy, market values. Normal, any normal Ukrainian will share these values. We left the Moscow Orthodox values. In the book, I describe, it's very difficult to find, besides Orthodox belief, in, there's the, beyond orthodox belief in the ultimate power of any tsar or the lord, there's other very, otherwise there's very little values in it. Now, by the way, incidentally, there's a lot of discussions and Russians, Russians came to the conclusion that the most important value of Russia now is not to allow one polar world. And of course, not to allow Ukraine to become part of the Western civilization. This, in my opinion, is the main problem today of unluck of Ukrainians. Unfortunate, misfortune. Our neighbor doesn't want us to uh, abandon the Moscow Orthodox civilization to join the West. By the way, I have my own opinion of why it happens. There's two reasons. First is if Ukraine will switch towards Western civilization, then it will strengthen the Western civilization. And that is why the goal, Putin's goal, to make from an active, make it a passive. In the condition the way it is, Ukraine is not active, it's a passive resource. And second reason why is Putin understands that Moscow Orthodox civilization is, uh, um, is doomed and is shrinking until 13th the the, the uh, GDP was 3% in comparison to 25 that America has and 12% that China has. Now we have 1.8%. And two years from now, by my calculations, it will be 1.6%. The Soviet Union fell apart when GDP of Russia, the Soviet Union fell down to 1%. That's when it fell apart. So I think that when Russian economy will shrink to 1%, it may fall apart. Uh, this is just by the way. And why Ukraine is so unsuccessful always? The fundamental reason I already outlined. The second reason is uh, flowing out of the first one. That in the duration of our history, Ukraine fought a lot, a lot, and sometimes it won, but as a rule, it lost. And here, I agree with Alexander Pashavir. When we were losing, we needed to survive, and very many negative aspects of the Ukrainian nation were formulated as a result of defeat and necessity to survive in the, under the conditions of the defeat. And I, for example, believe that these um, ability... Uh, 
Ah, Little Russian. Little Sorry. Russian. So it's such a, things as, as Little Russian. Definition of it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a derogatory definition for some Ukrainians. The second one. <laughs> yes. This is the result of defeat. But who is a Little Russian? Typical representative, for instance, is Gogol, or second one leading Little Russian is Tereshchenko, he minister, minister of Finances, the last one of the. He was the biggest oligarch in Russia, Ukrainian, and here in Ukraine he created half of the leading uh, uh, monuments, architectural, philharmonic, museums. So imagine this, the richest man is in this part of the world is a Ukrainian. Under his own guarantees, got the last credit to save Russia. Russian Empire. Example of little Russians. There's a good determination that this is a person who gives up even before the fight. It's a, it's a genius description of this. And, and he belongs to intelligentsia. I call them anti-Ukrainians. In other words, they're ethnically Ukrainians that caused more harm to Ukraine than Russia ever did. Now, I'd like to stop at the historical lessons. I'm not going to go. I'll just, I analyzed all of our history quickly, and I came to the conclusion that Ukrainians cannot be successful until they absorb and realize several historical lessons. I'm not going to mention all of them, but certain ones I'll, just, I'll mention briefly. Most sim the simplest one and the most understandable one. For example, Ukraine must be a dual language country. But second language it should not be Russian, it should be English. This is an element of civilization of Europe. Take, for example, any country, successful country in Europe, the more weight, is, the more people understand and use English language, the richer the country. Norway, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Dan Denmark, and, and on the other level we get Greece, Portugal, and many new countries which want to enter the EU. Second, we have to radically increase investments into culture and education. Budget of Ministry of Culture is a budget of one middle-level Hollywood movie. Approximately 20 times less than for person, than the population in Russia. When you come, when you come from this kind of policy, then Ukrainians Ukrainians go to movies 10 times less than the average European. Theaters, 20, 20 times in museum, also same time, 20, 25 times. I'm sorry, but capitalism presumes civilized employee, worker, a citizen, cultural, culturally endowed citizen. This very system is applies to, to uh, uh, education and to uh, academics. In Ukraine, we invest, if you take Academy of Sciences, we invest into walls. It's a house for the uh, elderly, it's a, a geriatrics old folks home, where institutions, institutes receive money for heat, for cars, but not for salaries for the teachers or academics. In Ukraine, for a person, we have three times more universities than they have in Germany or in America. 
80% of people that finish school go to universities. In Germany, 27%. But this, these universities are horns and hoof. I'm not going to list them all. But elementary historical goals that any other country should accomplish. But we don't do that. And I'm saying that never will our country be rich if we, our second language is going to be Russian. Why? Take statistics. All countries where second language is Russian. Those are the poorest countries in the world. And reverse. So we could not become culturally or te technically or innovationally uh, pr proceed future under these conditions. We will never be able to do this. So, and that's why the reforms are incomprehensible, and that's why bribes are flourishing, because it's culturally associated society, medium. Second part of the book um, are more academically uh, deductions, academic deductions. I'm also not going to stop on any one, but there's a theory, Nord's theory is there, analysis, of Washington's consensus and probably De Soto. You know the economist De Soto, who doesn't know him? Everybody knows him. At least you must know him. And there he proves that Ukraine is not unique. Half of the countries in the world are like us, unsuccessful. If you take Latin America, then he sees the main problem in that they don't capitalize on their uh, residential, on, on their living, on, on, the, on the houses. It's all illegal. Lawyers cannot uh, digitalize it, and you cannot capitalize on it. You could not take credit. You cannot get loans. You could not issue securities. It's all illegal. We, we have a mirror image. We have land. Land is illegal. You could not capitalize it. In other words, we're no different from poor Latin American countries. And they are also abused like we are abused. The very same De Soto, he says, shadow sector of economy is the answer, it's only an answer to the citizens on the behavior of the elite that construct a system that is uh, advantageous for monopolies and reversal is, uh, is uh, inconvenient and unprofitable for the rest of the population. And here, I don't agree with Alexander Pashaver that these are, that Ukrainians created this corruption system, that it's Ukrainians that are against Ukraine land market in Ukraine, that it's Ukrainians against privatization, and so on. No, this is the elite who are against it. These are the res this, its responsibility for these actions belong to the elite, our leaders. Something like Tatar, like Tatar Mongol tribes almost, Pashavra says. Tatar Mongols were a long time ago. That was a thousand years ago. The influence already has been cut off. Now Georgia is an example, for instance, when elite do, uh, when elite uh, uh, in, in Baltic republics, in Latvia, for instance, 50% are Russian, KGB, military, and it was a more difficult population than Ukraine had to deal with. But elite of these countries did their job. Now, I'll, uh, I'll move on to the more constructive part. I still got five more minutes. So, why do we have such big problems? In, besides everything I just mentioned. In Ukraine, there are five organs of power. In a normal country, they got three. You got courts, 
parliament and executive branch. In Ukraine, you also have oligarch authority, power, and it's not, and it's, it's not a bad word. Oligarchy has deputies, ministers, judges, regions, and already armed forces. Bandit formations, and not just bandits. In other words, it's a real power. And it's not just one oligarch. They got several here. And often they fight amongst each other. But there's always a favorite amongst the oligarchs. And the power, official power may change, but the oligarchs remain. But change is the favorite oligarch, main one, who has a lion's share of the monopoly, puts into, into, the, buck, into the budget. That's the fourth, and it's a real, that's real power. The fifth power authority is the external power. Until 2013, it was Russia. Russia had its own deputies, its own ministers, its own local powers, and it even had its own president. <laughs> And, and, and it grew, its power grew up to the level of president. So I thought after 2013, instead of Russia, it'll be either EU and or USA, the West. But we, have, we got paradox instead. Really, we have America and EU have some authority in Ukraine. They have small number of their deputies. Maybe one minister, maybe one minister they got. Maybe they get one or two governors. They don't have any armed forces. But they got money. So the way it happened was Russia still remained. You know, they have their own fractions. They have their own armed forces. And the West. So that's why it's a very difficult system of management in this system of management. It's very difficult in this system to conduct reforms. In other words, it's not history, it's not bad Ukrainians that created and continue to create this system. This is elite. It's elite who do this. So elite has to become responsible. And now a couple words about reforms because my topic actually is reforms. I think that reforms have to be have to begin with in order to have Ukraine develop a second language, English language, make it an official language, so that all children and government employees, new government employees, new English language. Without this, no reforms can take place. In principle, it just cannot occur. It doesn't take that many years, a few years, to do this reform and Western help. Now that will be real Western help to us when they would do finance five, ten thousand um, teachers, methodologies, and, and politicians. That would be the most massive and important reform. Next, reform, education reform. The government has to reduce the number of universities by at least three times. Um, I can give you an example. Everybody knows one dean that has university that is responsible for culture. But he created a parallel university, private one, with the same name. Now, state university prepares magisters and graduates. For, for haircutting, salon business. And this is government money. Government pays for this. University, technical universities, prepare masseuses, government money. Technical university 
prepares journalists for government money. This is madness, this discreditation of universities. And that's why we have to close them and create real, real universities. And for Ukraine, there's got to be half of them private that has to prepare all kinds of lawyers, economists, designers for money. Government has to finance only military, maybe beginning initially a little bit, medicine, doctors, just, just academic. That's it. We are not that rich to finance hundreds of thousands of lawyers. Incidentally, the more the country has lawyers, the lower the economic development of the nation. Thank you. And all the reforms, I'll reduce down to the following. You have to know the nature of Ukrainians. Ukrainians are not prepared, and I, I agree with Alexander Pashaver on this, to pay large amount of taxes. Just as an example, shadow economy in Ukraine, we have 42 million people. There has to be 21 people, million people have to work. 50% of the people in any European nation work and they pay taxes, 50%. We have people, who, we have 10 million people who work and pay taxes, not 21, but 10. We have to have 8 million pensioners. We have 12 million pensioners. This, and this is just the worst statistics, this is normative, not real. We have 4 million of young, healthy adults, no, of healthy adults among the pensioners. 4 million in the shadow economy and 4 million abroad, out of the country. Under these conditions, the country cannot become rich. And there are no other instruments to attract Ukrainians to come back, to create at least minimal taxes. In my school, in my business school, international business school, I always conduct surveys. Young businessmen there, they go there, 20 years old to 40 years old. How much are you honestly prepared to pay taxes from your income? And whoever is more modest and poorer, they say we pay 10%. We'll, we'll be here. The very rich ones, they're willing to pay 15%, maybe 20% tax. And that is what you have to consider. What are reforms? And what did Romans understand? What did Brit the British understand? Laws are not created by professors or politicians. Laws are made from the country. You take a status quo. What can people do? What are people agreed with? What do people want? That is how economic system is created and built. In other words, Ukrainians have to radically uh, uh, shrink their government for 10% for uh, GDP and create uh, and become like, Pol like Poles were 10 or 15 years ago, like Turkish people were. Ukrainians are ready to minimal social redistribution, but honestly, but honestly, that's it, I'm finished. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very interesting.